and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Whenever the name Meidugure comes up, what many people remember now is the insurgency that has gripped Borno, its home state, which has borne the brunt of Boko Haram attacks over the last decade. The violence, which has drawn international attention, has taken the lives of over 50,000 people and displaced over 2 million more who have had to take refuge in Meiduguri, the capital. But before the insurgency, Borno was so much more. It used to be a lively commercial center serving as a gateway for trade between the whole of northern Nigeria and the neighboring countries of Cameroon, Chad, Niger, Sudan, and so on. Meiduguri was its administrative and commercial capital, home to not just government offices, but also schools and many citadels of learning. One of them is the University of Meiduguri, which was established in 1975 and has offered an array of courses in its colleges and faculties. Meiduguri is now relatively safe and life is gradually returning back to normal as many towns and cities surrounding have also been liberated. But how has this insurgency impacted learning in its ivory towers? Hard copy tonight speaks with one who should know. Professor Aliyu Shugaba not only received his first degree from the University of Meiduguri, but has served as its vice chancellor for the last four and a half years. He joins us all the way from Meiduguri. Professor Shugaba, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you, Mope. Thank you for having me. We really appreciate your time all the way from Borno State. Well, the story of that state must be one of very mixed feelings for you, knowing that you were born in that state and received the most vital part of your education there. Did you feel a certain sense of affront when the problem of Boko Haram broke out in the state, challenging Western education? Well, uh, yes, it wasn't... Uh a good one because uh, we know Boko is not Haram. We know that any form of education as far as Islam is concerned is not something that... Uh, so for this to have come out from this uh, part of the country, I think it was really not uh, a good one. But uh, all the same, we had people who came out and said Western education or Boko as uh, it is, is Haram. Well, uh, the, 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 the entire situation was more of a setback to the entire northeast uh, region of the country, but particularly Borno and Yobia where I was hit. In this domain, in this same environment, is where the University of Maiduguri is, at the epicenter of the Boko Haram crisis. While we had to, you know, just continue with our mandate of teaching research and community services we were also challenged by that insurgency which lasted more than a decade how would you say learning was impacted because i imagine i know that in an environment of insecurity the first thing that parents are concerned about and even even the lecturers are concerned about is safety they want everyone wants to be able to keep their lives so how was learning within the University of Meiduguri impacted by the insurgency? Well, we found ourselves in a kind of situation that uh, uh, was so difficult. If you choose to close the university, you never know when it was going to be reopened. If you now say, let's go on, the, the bombs were blasting around my degree, around you know, the university, within my degree, and even at the peripheries of the university. But to be candid with you, we had the support of the federal government deploying the military right on the fence, you know, on the, on the, on the perimeters of the university. And uh, we also had the police, the DSS, and every security outfit rallying around us to ensure that the university never fell to the insurgency. And in that situation, we too had to take a resolve that if we had closed the university at any point in time during the crisis, then we were going to be faced with a situation where majority of our students who would be following the routes 
that had already been taken over by the Boko Haram. The Boko Haram would just take advantage of them and conscript them into their own fold. So that was something we had to, you know, uh, come to terms with. And we decided that we resolved that we were going to continue. Even when in 2017, the Minister of Education at that time came to Maiduguri and was uh, trying to suggest that the university should be closed. He saw the resolve of our Senate and Senate uh, decided that we were not going to close the university. The students too took that resolve with us. If, they cl if we close the university, where would they go? They can't access their homes. They can't go anywhere. There was only one route leading in and out of Maiduguri and that route was so dangerous. Many lives have, you know, been lost on those, you know, path which the the possible path which can be followed to go anywhere. The road between Maiduguri and Damatru. So we prefer to stay within our own territory and enjoy the the, the support of the military. And that was it. And having resolved that, we know that if anything happens to any one of us in the university, let's say the vice chancellor, if he's eliminated, then someone comes in, take his own position. And if they want, let them kill all of us. That was the resolve. That was the spirit. And with that spirit, without resolve, we were actually able to withstand the pressure from the Boko Haram insurgents. And we continued till date. We have never closed the university for even a minute, save for ASU strike or uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's the only situation that led us to close the university. And it was in the middle of all of that that you were named vice chancellor. I think it was in 2019 you became vice chancellor a year before COVID-19 broke. I mean, it was like I said, the that's crisis what... from the insurgency wasn't enough. Then COVID came. Um, how challenging was that for you when you wore the hat as vice chancellor of, of a university right in the middle of an insurgency? It was really challenging, but then we had already taken a resolve not to close the university. Um, coming in as a vice chancellor in 2019, up to, I think, December 2019, all was well because we, 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 we were receiving much attention from government and everything was going on very well until when the pandemic came in and uh, the directive was given on the 23rd of, uh, was it March 2020, that the universities should be closed. That was the only time we closed this university. I mean, or how did insurgency impact enrollment? We, we understand that before now, University of Meduguri used to get up to 25,000 students. What is the current situation with student enrollment and the student population at Unimade? Surprisingly, Mope, University of Meduguri has the largest number of student population now. Our student population is almost about 75,000. And we are ahead of most of Nigerian universities, except National Open University that is ahead of us. And it would also surprise you to know that we have remained the most cosmopolitan university in this country. We have students drawn from all over the country. There is not a single local government, I think, in this country that does not have a student at the University of Medjugorje. That is very interesting to note, uh, Prof. But I'm just wondering, I, I do not know if sometimes you, when you, whenever it is you drive around the university, because you got your first degree from the University of Meiduguri. I'm sure it's so much more different from when you were a student. Now as vice chancellor, when you go around, do you feel, what is the sense that you feel? Do you feel a sense of loss? Do you feel a sense of, oh, if only we didn't have this insurgency, it would be so much better. What exactly is the sense that you have for the University of Meiduguri as a former student of the school? Uh, when I go around the university, I see a university that Despite the odds, we are going through very meaningful development, uh, expanding intellectual space within the system. We have uh, had more academic programs that have come up, sometimes some of them uh, coming up as a result of the post-insurgency situation that we find ourselves in. We had to come up with programs that will produce the manpower for you know organizations to be able to manage certain things. 
So I feel very happy when I go around the university and see for myself that uh, despite the situation uh, on ground, we have still been able to, to, to make some good development within the system. We have achieved a lot and uh, we have a lot to showcase. Well, I'm glad you said despite the odds, but the odds were there anyway. I mean, the odds are still there. That's the, that's the truth of them. The, the odds will be there. Well, what must, uh, will I say, your, your resilience has been remarkable I, in, the, in the face of all that has happened in, 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 in Meiduguri. Have there been situations where you've had to confront, or maybe a confront is not the word now, but partner, apart from this uh, sort of partnering which you, which you say you've done, I think what I'm looking for is advice. Advise government whether there has been a proper handshake between the town and gown on certain other, uh, you know, on certain other decisions that had to be taken uh, with regards to what was happening within uh, Borno State itself, especially with regards to, you know, the insurgency and getting back on their feet. Well, one thing I'm happy about is that the town and gown relationship uh, between the university and uh, the host community has been very, very excellent. And uh, we have related very much with the traditional institution within the state, with the state government. We are working together. There was a time in the effort of the state government to bring about a settlement and uh, some succor for the people. The university has always been consulted in many ways, and uh, we have always responded uh, very positively in a very good way that would help the state government. And uh, as it is, there is nothing we do without uh, really, you know, extending our invitation to the state government. And the state government also extend invitation to us for whatever they want to do in terms of programs that will bring about, you know, uh, some kind of uh, alleviation of the entire difficulty that people are facing within the university, uh, within the Borno State uh, uh, community. Well, looking ahead now, um, I, I, a lot of people will really want that this insurgency is behind us. And we know that largely, to a great extent, um, insurgency, uh, the Boko Haram insurgency, is now on the fringes. It's now being fought on the fringes. Um, but there are other kinds of insecurity problems that the country is dealing with, banditry, kidnappings, etc. Um, as one who has been in the middle of this, what other word would you be given to, you know, uh, policymakers and government officials, particularly at the federal level, having lived in the middle of conflict? Well, uh, the, the situation with security is that uh, when we leave security for only the security agencies, then it becomes problematic because quite a number of them may not even know exactly the way the situation is. But when we bring in local people, when we bring in the traditional, you know, rulers and uh, district heads and all of this, I think it is uh, going to bring some kind of uh, relief. Uh, one thing that we have to do is the issue of uh, community policing is also very important. I see recently that uh, the governor, governor of Zamfara State has uh, come up with uh, a kind of special guard to try to help the uh, government security establishments to fight the insecurity in the region. I think that is the, the, the way to go forward with it. In Borno State, when uh, real progress was achieved, it was because the military now started working with the civilian, you know, uh, joint task force. And with that kind of combination, they could go and face the insurgents head on and achieve success. And that was what brought success in my degree. Hunters, vigilante, and almost everybody was conscripted in, into this business of getting security back. And you could see, when the governor becomes so serious, we started recording you know, success in handling the security issue right from the time of uh, the vice president, now when he was the governor of Borno State, he came to the university. We sat in the vice chancellor's office at that time, I was serving as a uh, deputy vice chancellor of academic services. And when that, when, when that meeting took place, my vice chancellor was not even around. So I sat for my vice chancellor and we discussed, we recruited the hunters, about 50 of them, recruited 
uh, vigilante, those you call a civilian, you know, uh, JTF. We brought in the Civil Defense Corps, the DSS. All of us were working together and we achieved success with that kind of thing. So, I mean, looking ahead now, the fact that you were born in, you were born in Maiduguri, I think you were born in, is it Bama, Buratai, I think. You may correct me. I was me. born in Buratai. Yes, yes. indeed. Um, so, ha looking ahead now, I know that, you know, the topography, the, will I say, the outlook of the place is so much different from how it was when you were growing up. And perhaps even the, it's like that for most people who, who were, uh, you know, who even grew up in maybe villages and the villages have become cities. But yours has been a, a bit different. Looking ahead, what do you, how do you see the Meduguri developing post an insurgency, post conflict, and also the university right in the middle of it? Now we have this situation brought by a kind of indoctrination and uh, the whole of the region has become, you know, so difficult to live in, but uh, God so kind, people are still alive. Those that have been killed have been killed those that have survived have survived and we are still trying to forge ahead we are trying to see how we can the role of the university in all of this is to tell people that look we have to take responsibility of our own security with the help of the government we can achieve that what borno state government is doing uh his excellency governor uh omara uh, Babagana omara zulum has done quite a lot and we we are always looking at things together. Where there is uh, an issue, he goes there by himself with his own, you know, entourage. And they look at things, try to address issues. And by that, the communities are feeling that, yes, they have the presence of government, you know, in their midst. And the government is trying to look at their own predicament and try to bring us some succor. So... When governments approach the whole thing with this kind of, uh, you know, effort, I think uh, people will also be able to key in, provide information to the security agencies, and head on, we can fight all of these things. There's nowhere in the whole world that is safe. Problems everywhere and then. But even in the face of the crisis, what I've always said is that there are positive things happening. Let's also look at the positive things happening. Some In some places, the positive things are even more than the negative things happening. But uh, uh, sometimes media also concentrates only on the negative happenings, overlooking the, you know, the, the, the positive sides. So if we balance some of these things, it will encourage us to also try to say, okay, we must fight and remain you know, skewed and things like that will lead to a better society. What about the ideology? The ideology that brought about Boko Haram in the very first instance? Would you say that it's been wrestled to the ground? Well, ideologies are always there. But sometimes you find ideologies, if you have to deal with it, like in the university now, our own way of fighting this ideology is to say, well, we don't believe Boko is Haram. And in the university, there are Muslims uh, who share the same religion with these people who are claiming to. And to us, once you adopt that kind of uh, ideology, I, we have many Muslim preachers who are saying that that ideology is not even Islamic. So through that kind of uh, dissemination of knowledge and information and things like that, we try to debunk that. And uh, I think the, the ideology itself is dying out. Happy to hear that. But, I mean... <laughs> I wanted to ask you, as we wrap up um, this conversation now, I know that mm. your tenure is also coming to an end as a vice chancellor, um, yeah. unless, of course, you get reappointed, which is also a possibility. But what would you like to be remembered for? I want to be remembered as someone who loves the University of Madrid so much that in the entire time space that I worked for the university, I've always seen the students as my first line of stakeholders and as a vice chancellor i work very closely with my management with my academic staff with my colleagues generally whether they're in the academic 
or they are in the non-teaching you know, uh, sector of the university. That relationship that I've enjoyed with them has made it possible for me to leave the university and achieve great success for the university. We have achieved a lot in the face of so much difficulty. The only thing that I did not like so much was when we were placed on this IPPIS, you know, mode of payment of salaries in the universities. Honestly, I must admit here that the university suffered a great deal. And as it is now, we thank the government of uh, President Chinubu for removing the universities from that. Although we have still not been removed completely, we are still receiving our salaries to the IPPIS. But honestly, I must say that that is the greatest, the greatest achievement of this government by removing the universities. Otherwise, with time, the way things were happening with the IPPIs, the university system would have been killed. And that is the only, it came to a point that about 200 of my staff came to me complaining that they have not been paid their salaries for no just reason. There was no reason at all. I tried to find out, did you take loans for those who were receiving, a professor receiving 234,000 when his salary should have actually been around, you know, uh, 400 and something thousand, close to 500,000. But that one, many of my professors came and were complaining that they were salary, their salaries were just 234,000, 200 and something, not up to 300,000. That one was so, so painful to me. And when they came and complained that they had not been paying salaries for four months, I couldn't do anything about it. We wrote letters to IPPS several times, and that was not addressed. To date, as I speak to you, quite a number of them still have outstanding salaries, not the ones stopped by government during the time of the strike, after the strike. So these kind of things are so demoralizing, but as a, man as a, as a, as a manager or as a leader in the university, you just have to find a way of making your staff truly deliver, but they were so, so much demoralized. Has the situation improved now, Prof? About what? The situation of the salaries? IPP, yeah, the salaries. Even now that you say that you, you've been removed, but not completely. In fact, even sitting in this studio, I have a professor who has only been paid his salary for three months. How are you getting around that? Well, we he continued to write to IPPIS, and now there's a verification going on. Something that is happening is terrible. People who have come for verification, the university doesn't even know about them. And while we're questioning them, what is, where were you? The, the person simply said he was in Lagos. What were you doing? What are you doing in Lagos? Yet your name is on the payroll of the university. The university didn't know about this. And there are a number of them. And that is, so at last the person simply said that he was one of the candidates of the former accountant general or so. And that was a very serious thing. You see these kind of things, you won't even know what is happening. It, it implying that people were just put on the payroll of the university without the of university's course. knowledge. Of course, yes, that was what happened. And we got to know about that from people who came for verification. And so, when they came for verification, they were never known in the university. The university doesn't even know about them. Yet so, they have been drawing salaries. So instead we of ask the, them, have you? Yeah. So instead of the IPPIS to now become something to verify the actual number of lecturers and pay them correctly it now became a system where, pe where people's names were just infused into the system and then those people were getting salaries for nothing. That is what we got to know recently in the course of the verification exercise that was ordered by the government. This is very worrisome indeed, Professor. Um, now that the federal government has ordered that the universities be taken out of IPPIS, why is it taking so long to implement? Well, I think the university, the, the, the government is trying to work out modalities together with the university on how to, you know, disengage from the IPPI 
podcast and adopt whatever platform that uh, the government is working on it. And that is even the reason for the verification exercise that is going on now. In the meantime, for those lecturers that have not been paid, what remedies are you finding for them? Well, we have written to IPPIS and uh, we are still not sure whether they will be paid. Uh, we have been told that even the January salary uh, would be paid with, uh, uh, through the IPPIS. So we are waiting to see if they will pay them or not. If they don't, by the time we disengage, we will make a case for them with the government and government may now direct whatever uh, has to be done. Well, Vice Chancellor Professor Aliyu Shugaba, thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy tonight. And we wish you all the thank very you best very in much. your future endeavors. It's been nice talking to you, Mape. Well, that's the program tonight. Your feedback is always welcome. Please share them with us using the handles showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Maupe Ogwin Yusuf. Good night.